Happy Father's Day! Oh, well, welcome to our Father's Day gathering where we're, we're, we're shining a light on all things men, like explosions. NASCAR and guns. Girls and video games. Chopping wood and fighting. Sports and lifesaver fights. Now, we know that all men, every man, every man. loves sports, girls, cars, and guns. At least that's what culture tries to tell us. But here, Pastor Jonathan, I knew your dad. Yes, he you did. really didn't fit this stereotype. So I wonder, did you grow up feeling the pressure to become a car-loving, gun-toting, girl-chasing sports fanatic? <laughs> uh, not at all. You knew my dad. Uh, you know, I love sports and I love one girl. Uh, but I think those stereotypes don't fit most of us, really. They don't fit many men at all. And my dad was very different. My dad was more of an intellect. Uh, mm. He preferred books over sports, and he preferred the church over cars. How about your dad? You know, my parents had two girls, and my dad was an uber sports fanatic. So we grew up with the expectation that we would love sports, specifically Detroit. And so we grew up <laughs> loving the Tigers, I'm the sorry. Red Wings, the Lions. You shouldn't be sorry. They're fantastic teams. You know, there was absolutely no... We went to all the games. We had all the gear. There was no other option in our house but to cheer. I think that if we had not cheered for Detroit, we probably would have been disowned. And so today we're going to celebrate men, and we're going to explore the top three things that the Bible doesn't teach about men. But sometimes I think... We believe them. And we ch we're taking the same approach as we did to Mother's Day. We're going to push back against some of what society or even religion says that women and men should be like. So when we were preparing, like how could we push back at some of the perceptions, conceptions that people have of men? Uh, we went to scripture and it didn't take, it took us like a second, Pastor Jessica. Maybe. We went looking for two of the biggest alpha males we could find in scripture. And it was easy to find. In the Old Testament, it was David. In the New Testament, it was Paul. And we're going to look at their lives and what made them real men. Because I don't think it's explosions or the it, Blue Jays. No. You know what? There's this incredibly descriptive verse about David in the Bible that I think would probably make a good Tinder profile. <laughs> Take some notes, guys. There's a verse in the guys. Bible. It says this. Have you seen the son of Jesse, David of Bethlehem, who knows how to play the liar. Oh, the liar. What a romantic instrument. We need, we need a liar on stage here. We need more liars at one church. But deal. not the type that don't tell the truth. No, no, no. <laughs> That's a good dad joke there, yeah, Pastor there you Jonathan. Go. There you go. The verse goes on to say, he was a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well, and he was a fine looking man. And the Lord is with him. So, in other words, check, check, check. What a man. Yeah, swipe right, swipe right? Swipe right, Swipe right, yes. You know, he was a formidable man. He not only did defeat Goliath, the great giant, who's probably 15 or 19 years old when he did that, he was a brave warrior. In his day, they were singing songs about him. Kind of like I, Taylor Swift. Per, I could have been. It could have been the Swifty of his day. Yeah. I don't know what her name was, but songs like this lyric, Saul has slain his thousands, and Saul was a king in that era, but David is tens of thousands. You know what? David was also a prolific poet and a writer. He wrote some of the most famous words that we love from the Bible, verses like this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear. See, David was so in touch with God that his artistic expression actually flowed from his relationship with God. And he was a gifted musician, obviously, and dancer. In fact, the children of God are bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And in 2 Samuel, it records these words. David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. When was the last time you guys did that? <laughs> like dance with everything you got inside you. David's dancing with all of his might. It said before the Lord, and when his wife, King da uh, the wife of King David, saw him leaping and dancing before the Lord, she said, with as much sarcasm as possible, how wonderful. <laughs> the king has distinguished himself today, exposing himself to the eyes of his servant maids, some, like some burlesque street dancer. <laughs> I mean, she's, she, she's not happy. You it. can ha sense the heat in that one. You know what? <laughs> David was an artist, but he was also a warrior. He was a king, but he was a servant. He was a saint, but he certainly was a sinner. You know, we can't say David and Goliath without saving David and Bathsheba. 
See, like all men, David was a a mixed bag of contradictions. He was both impressive, but he was also oppressive. David was honorable, but he was also dishonorable. Mm. And David was strong, but he was also incredibly weak. Now, David dominates the Old Testament, but Paul, the man who launched the global church, actually dominates the New Testament. See, Paul had this impressive LinkedIn profile. He was a visionary leader. He was a strategic thinker. He was also a prolific writer, and he was an inspirational speaker. You know what I love about Paul? He was ambitious. Like, Paul was going to go places. He writes this. He says, I was so enthusiastic about my work that I advanced head and shoulders above my peers in my career. I mean, next time we have an opening here at One Church Steel, yes, I'd like to hire Paul. Let's Based hire on that him. LinkedIn alone. Yes. Have you noticed some people's LinkedIn doesn't live up to who stands in front of you? Uh, his would. Yep. His was. He was impressive. He was also, David was a warrior, just like, just like David. He was also a warrior. He says this of himself. He said, in those days, I went all out persecuting God's church. I was systematically destroying it. And I love that word systematically because I think that describes Paul's personality. That's how he approached God and even life. He was incredibly disciplined. He was a zealot warrior. He was a massive intellect, a great orator. He was an artisan, a writer. He was a saint. And a sinner, Mm -hmm. like David, like all men. I think what's interesting about these two men, they were so strong. And whenever you meet someone that's really strong, usually they're experienced with great strength. They were so strong, they were stubborn. They were so weak in areas that they were wrecking balls. In fact, you read the story of the Apostle Paul, and God had to sit him down on the road to Damascus to get his attention, to bring him to his senses. The same way God had to dress David down in front of an entire crowd, get in his face through a prophet to get his attention. Friends, Paul and David proved to us that this first statement about men can't possibly be true. All men like football, guns, girls, and cars. Now, the truth is that society often wants us to believe that this is a man, but this description of a man is defined by culture. It's certainly not what the Bible emphasizes. See, in the beginning, the scriptures tell us that God created Adam. And it says, God formed man out of the dirt from the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. And what did God do when he created him? Well, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. You see, Adam is working at caring for God's creation. It was a lot of work. And you know what? He was alone. Well, technically not totally alone. He, he had the animals, right? Okay. And I okay. think Adam must have had a dog like, I got a dog. Oh, this is Luna. Luna. And when I'm working on my computer, this is where she puts her head to get a little attention. Because after all, a dog is man's best, man's best friend. Man's best friend, right? We all know cats are a part of the fall and the I curse don't of know. sin. I like cats. But, but and, uh, the dogs are so loyal. They're calming. Like this viral video that went, by, well, it went viral by voice actor Paul Rugg as he talks about how his dog calms him down. Let's take a look. How do I relax? Well... Uh, I come home and I I pet my dog. You see, petting your dog is one of the most relaxing things you can possibly do. It releases a hormone called oxytocin, which reduces stress. Also, it lowers your heart rate and it lowers your blood pressure. Plus, people who pet their dogs are five times more likely to live longer than people who just have cats. I don't know, Pastor Jonathan. That didn't look very relaxing to me. I, I think that was a cat, though. It looked like a okay, cat. Okay, okay, whatever. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so animals were not enough for Adam, but at least he had God, right? But God says this interesting thing after he creates Adam, and Adam gets to work to cre- caring for creation. It says, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Yeah. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And so God makes him a partner to share in this caring work. And the first woman is named Eve, and she is a co-laborer. And she has the same role description 
as Adam has, the exact same one. See, both of these Adams, Adam is actually, in the Hebrew Bible, it's just the word for human. They were both human. There was sameness amidst their differences. They had the same roles. They were a same, they were, there was enough sameness that it vanquished the loneliness that was in Adam. Now, Pastor Jonathan, that word sameness doesn't mean exactness, does exactly. it? Exactly. It's not that God didn't create differences in men and women. He did. And these differences stretch beyond what we see in the biological differences. The truth is you can be a woman and you can like cars and sports. The same is true that you can be a man and not enjoy sports and cars. Because these cultural markers do not determine what a man or a woman is. And if a man is not defined by cultural markers, but by God's design, then what makes him a man. Well, first we see physical differences, don't we? Men are often able to get stronger and faster at a quicker weight. That's undeniable. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I wish I was repping you better. but <laughs> So we see those physical differences. What other differences well, do we see? Uh, also, you can see uh, emotional or actually relational wiring yeah. differences. Uh, women, and it's statistical, are better at building community around them. Men are often disadvantaged in that capacity. And so sometimes it's true. It's, well, it's true. Not all men like sports. Not all women like fashion. There sense, tends to be a different motor, especially in our early ages and stages that you see. Like, I mean, you're raising two girls and a boy. Yeah. Any differences? You know what? My son, Max, was born into a very pink home because he had two older sisters. And so from a very early age, we actually didn't have boy toys in his first years of life. But I remember one day, it was dinner, Max was young, he was sitting on his high chair, and he began turning his food into cars. He didn't have cars. And he was driving <laughs> them off of his high chair. See, he didn't have any boy toys, so he was just making his own. And it fascinated me how different that Max was from his sisters. Not because of the cars or the toys, but because, like you said, there was that energy about him. See, he was wired to move. That was probably the biggest difference that I noticed mm. in those early years of parenting. Max, where my girls, they needed to connect to grow. He needed to move to grow. And that seems to follow boys as they interact with their world. Now, Max is almost eight years old, and him and his buddies have started wrestling with each other. And the first time I saw a fight break out at the park, I jumped in to intervene. I was thinking someone, someone was getting hurt, and so I was very firm with them. And I stopped them, and I said, what is going on? Who started this fight? And all of these little boys, they looked back at me with these blank, confused looks on their faces, and they were like, we're fine. No one's hurt. We just like to fight. See, <laughs> this was something I didn't know. My girls had never done this before. Now, they had fought with their words plenty of times with their friends, but they never had used their bodies. I don't know. Were your kids the same way? I, I, I remember early, because I have two boys, and Shelly didn't have brothers. My, my wife, my partner, she didn't have, ever have brothers. I remember getting calls at work, and she because Caleb and Keenan were duking it out in the backyard. And she'd go, she called, Jonathan, is this normal? Are, are, are our kids crazy? <laughs> What's going on with them? And I would laugh on the other end. I said, I'd almost be more concerned if they didn't do this. Okay. See, I grew up in a home with three brothers and two sisters. This is, this is the gang right here. I, I grew up in this gang. We're all like a year apart. And I, I noticed there are differences that stretch beyond our childhood right into modern day with us. We started a group chat a few years ago. And I can see a specific amount of, if there was a prize for the <laughs> volumes of text messages in the, in the chat, the shared chat, I'm just telling you this, none of the boys would win. My, my sister sends books. We respond with emoticons. <laughs> like, she'll send this, and we go, thumbs up. <laughs> like, but that's just, we, it's not that we don't like the connection. We love the connection. Yeah. We just didn't need the volume of connection. You know what? That tracks. You know what, friends? There is a danger in defining a man from cultural markers or norms, or even defining women and men by generalized differences. Because what defines a man is found in how God has designed them. Mm. See, when we see David and Paul at their very best, we see some of these design superpowers. Faithfulness, sacrifice, serving, 
protecting and nurturing, Mm. even stewarding what God has entrusted them with. See, this view of a man actually celebrates the diversity of God's creation and also, though, the responsibility that he has entrusted to us. I, I hope, men, we can take some of the weight off of you. Just some of the weight of expectations off of you. You're not less of a man if you don't fit that stereotype. You're not even more of a man if you do uh, fit that stereotype. A man is judged not by, by his interests, but by his character. It's not his toys. It's his actions. That's what distinguishes us. Yeah. So we're here to take some weight off, and we're going to also take some weight off by spreading some responsibility. Right, Pastor Jessica? Absolutely. You know what? We're going to push back on the second lie that we're often tempted to believe, and it's this one. Men are designed to be the primary breadwinners and the heads of the household. Now, many people... Wait, I'm here for this. Yeah, you can get some yeah. popcorn, yeah. I wish we could hand let's go, it out, let's right? Let's go. Uh, many people believe that the Bible dictates that men must be the primary financial providers for their families. You see, sometimes we read the Bible into our culture, and sometimes we read the culture into our Bible. In this case, we're probably reading our culture into the text. That term breadwinner and head of household, they're actually fairly modern concepts. The term breadwinner is thought to have been first introduced in the UK in the 1800s. Because bread was a staple of most people's diets, the term was coined that whoever brought home the bulk of the income that could purchase the bread was called the breadwinner. Now, the term head of household, this was introduced in about the 1950s by governments. And interestingly, it is not a role description, but rather it's a financial designation. So the designation head of household shifts depending on which individual is earning the higher income. Now, I know what you want to say. Pastor Jessica, what about those verses in the Bible that call the man the head of the household? Well, let's pick up from one of them. Our our New Testament alpha male, Paul, wrote this. Wives, submit. (laughs) You can almost feel the testosterone rising. (laughs) You can, right? (laughs) Submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, on the surface, this sounds very modern alpha male. Wives, submit. But Paul is, in fact, using his strength in a very patriarchal society to free the woman. You see, the word here for submit is actually hupotasso, and it's a military term. And this is what it means. It literally translates to woman Stand by your man and defend him. Be ready to support him. Go to war and battle together. Now, the word being used for head here is kafale, which translates to mean the source. We first looked at this word on Mother's Day and discovered it's not a hierarchy term, but rather it's a partnership term. This word points back to Eden when the woman came from the man's side. So therefore, it's emphasizing unity and equality in the male-female relationship. Paul is saying that God designed the marriage relationship for a partnership, just like Adam and Eve are instructed to be co-laborers. The most beautiful iteration of this partnership is when both parties embrace serving each other. It's beautiful. Win-win. Win-win. In this verse, Paul is saying that the man must be willing to self-sacrifice for his partner and the family, just like the woman is to be able to self-sacrifice for her partner and her family. You see, this is good news for women because it means they are not subservient. And it's good news for men because it means they are not alone in providing for their family. In fact, nowhere in Scripture does God put the full weight of the financial responsibility on a man. He designed us to co-partner together and share the load. Okay, so that's Paul's era. Now, what about David? What about his era? Well, in David's era, especially just, just after David passed away, the same era, a great book is written. I read it every year. I hope you do. It's the book of Proverbs, just filled with great wisdom. Uh, great for life. I, I love reading that every year. But in the last chapter, it gives a portrait, a picture of what a, you should look for in a partner in life. And it gives a picture and a story of a partner that's carrying their end of the couch. 
Okay, so, let's so take it, it looks like this. And so if you're single, I would take this list. I'd take a picture of this. In Proverbs 31, this partner puts God first. They respect and honor God, and that's kind of where it begins. They're trustworthy. They have your back even when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. They're wise and kind. They speak wise words, and wise people sometimes know when not to speak too, Pastor Jessica, not just what they speak. And they spread kindness widely, widely. They hustle. They get up early in the morning. They're not afraid to take on new, to roll up their sleeves, get the work done, try new things. And they're leveling up. They're always working on themselves, helping themselves be better versions of themselves, physically, emotionally, spiritually. This is from the Bible, or are you just describing our partners? Because Skip and Shelly are a lot like this. I know, and Skip and Shelly are perfect, and we married up 100%. Okay, yeah. But this, this this was describing a female partner in Proverbs chapter 31. And in it, she, it's calling on her to ca- carry the responsibility to roll up her sleeves, use her intellect, use her giftings to help financially provide for the family, but also be a partner in this, in this together, carrying the weight together. I love how the, it's like the gospel. The gospel is win-win. If somebody's losing, that's not the gospel. And this is a beautiful relationship and the one that God invites us in. So men, you don't have to carry it alone. You don't have to carry along. So, you know, Pastor Jessica, how's your marriage look like as you kind of, man, this is a tough list Ooh. to stack up against, but like when you talk about roles and just how you've managed your life, how's it been with, with Skip? Give us the deets, the let's, tea. Let's go Give us the down. tea Yeah, on like we're Skip. in the counseling, the therapist office. You know what? Um, there have been seasons in which I have stayed home with our children. It made more sense for me to stay home. There have been seasons where it made more uh. sense for Skip to lean towards the home and me not to lean towards the home. In fact, you'll laugh at this, Pastor Jonathan. When I first took this role here at One Church TO, I had a couple of people come up to me and they said something along these lines. They said, oh, what will happen on the evenings when you have to work, when Skip has to babysit the children? What will your family eat? Which was shocking to me because I looked back at them and said, oh, well, Skip's my partner and he is also a parent and he's not babysitting our children. He's just a parent when he's at home. And surprisingly, Skip can cook. So... They're fine. In fact, he makes more food than I do sometimes. The irony is if Shelly was out, nobody would ask them. You know, or, <laughs> or if I'm out, nobody's asking me, who's watching your kids? Yep. Yeah, so Shelly and I have gone through different iterations of this. Early on, we chose that uh, Shelly was working, and it's work, raising our kids at home. I was out. But that's why every time we came home and we got paid, I'd say we got paid today. That's good. Because it was our work that was accomplishing this. It wasn't my money. I mean, she's working as hard as I am, maybe harder. And some, sometimes I'd come home and Way she'd harder. be so hungry just to talk because she hasn't had an adult conversation all day. I, re, I would be like, I'm done talking. And she'd be like, what'd you do today? What, what happened? And I'd be like, you know, passive aggressively, like I'm trying to shut that down. And, she, and I'd somehow <laughs> say, well, I had a meeting with someone I wanted to eat. You went out to eat with somebody and you, you didn't have to cut their meat up for them? Like what was going on? And now Shelly's out working, and we, we have different rhythms. She likes to mow the lawn. I do most of the cooking. I do the dishes. I, I clean the bathroom. Wait, wait. Don't keep score. We, don't we, keep we, score. we share the load. We share the load. You know what? You might have traditional roles, and that's okay. Yep. Uh, we all need to decide what is best with our present circumstances and our present season. So there might be seasons where it makes more sense for you to work outside of the home. And there might be seasons that it makes more sense for you to remain at home. And there's others who may find themselves in seasons where they take on the majority or all of the roles in their household. Whatever season you find yourself in, it's important to remember your role does not dictate who you are. Mm. Who you are is dictated by who created you. The reality is that none of us are perfect partners. Only God is the perfect partner. He's the perfect provider He's the perfect leader. He is our strong partner, and we were designed to actually be dependent on him. That means that even in our earthly partnerships, we need to be dependent on God. And the key to recognize this is to recognize that our marriage relationships are actually side-by-side partnerships. Two co-laborers working together while leaning on the provider who created them both. 
I, I hope you're hearing, men, how much we appreciate, appreciate and respect you. Yeah. For all the men who've just worked in partnership with someone just to try to raise your children, provide for them, stand in front of them. For all those men who keep stepping up, keep showing up, keep, that are strong enough not to do it all by themselves. Uh, men like my dad, who are even strong enough to let my mom lead. I just want to say, uh, we love you. We respect you deeply. So, you know, I guess some of the cultural markers about guns, footballs, sports and stuff, those, those, those things I think we can put aside. Mm -hmm. And even this idea that it's all on you, it's on us, it's on the we, not the me. And the last one I want to talk about is really an area, I think, where men are disadvantaged. Guys, we got to get better at this. We really do. And it's because many of us believe this truth. We believe that men aren't and shouldn't be emotional. Mm -hmm. And that's not a biblical idea. In fact, that idea is kind of rooted in Greco-Roman Stoicism philosophy. Stoicism was a philosophy that elevated the rational, the logical, uh, and the self-discipline uh, at the expense of the emotional. Emotions were things that were to be suppressed and dismissed and lowered. They weren't as important. And that Stoicism spread throughout the Greco-Roman Empire, and it got entrenched in the modern Western society during the Industrial Revolution. In the Industrial Revolution, that's where it gave breath to this idea that emotional expression was viewed as a weakness. I mean, from a young age, I don't know how many times I heard, I wonder how many times you've heard, I hope many of the younger men haven't heard this, but I just heard, boys don't cry. Boys don't cry. Boys are socialized to suppress emotions like sadness. And they're kind of celebrated to elevate emotions like anger. But this is not what Scripture says, because I've even heard people talk that the Bible talks about suppressing your emotions, and it doesn't. It might talk to you about controlling your emotions, but it doesn't tell you to suppress it. Couldn't be more different. Let's take the case of David and Paul here in Scripture, because they, they cry many times. They're very emotional men. Absolutely. You know what? Scripture paints for us two very emotional men when we look at David and Paul. The first one, King David, well, he was very emotional. He expresses joy, love, fear. We hear him write about anxiety, sorrow, regret. We see him have anger, frustration, guilt, and shame. The apostle Paul, he too was emotional. He had joy, gratitude in his letters. We hear love and sorrow, distress and anger, frustration, fear, anxiety, hope, and sadness. It, it's tough because men don't get rewarded often for crying. You often get penalized for it. Uh, but, you know, I, listen, if there's somebody here and you're just going like, listen, I want, a, I want a scripture to hang on to when I leave this place. Pastor Jessica, if you're giving someone a scripture, like we want it to memorize it. I want them to know it when they leave the door. What's the easiest scripture for them to memorize? The easiest, shortest scripture? Jesus wept. Yeah, John 11, right? John 11. Well, these two alpha males cried often. I'm only going to give you a couple occasions because there were too many to remark, but these are strong people. I want you to remember this. David, we capture him in a moment. His best friend Jonathan has been killed. And he is weeping. Mm. He is crying. It says this. David was super sad and cried a ton. This is the Gen Z version. <laughs> and didn't eat all day. He's so sad. He didn't eat. He cried the whole time. It's a very difficult day. There's another moment when David loses his son Absalom. Absalom has been killed. Absalom's a rebellious, very difficult person. And it says this of David. The king was so emotional, he went to the room above the gate, and he cried, he cried his heart out. This is an emotional man. These are emotional moments. Yeah. Then you... You know what? Some of this doesn't really surprise me. Because if you've read the Psalms, you know that David, he's really at ease at expressing, expressing himself. Expressing his emotions, describing them, right? You know what? He, he reminds us that tough stuff happens to everyone. Men's tough stuff happens to you. David was as tough as they come, but he embraced his emotions. Someone once said this. They said, crying doesn't mean a person is weak. It just means that they have a heart. See, David loved deeply, and therefore he just experienced hurt deeply. It doesn't shock me that David cried. But Paul, 
was not exactly the type of person who you might think tears come easily to. It's, it's true. David doesn't surprise me because of the way he wrote. Paul does. Yeah. Because Paul, Paul was tough as nails. He wrote things like this. He wrote this. He said, getting haters, but still got the squad. Going through tough times, but we ain't going to break. Been surrounded and battered by trouble, but we're not letting up. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. I, you could just, David, uh, Paul's the type of guy who's going to climb every hill. Yeah. And he's tough as nails, but he cried often. One time, he's under a personal attack. Someone's questioning his authority. They're questioning his character. And he says this, I was going through a ton of hard times, and my heart was hurting so bad. When I wrote to you, there were tears streaming down from my face. In one translation, it says that there were more tears than ink on the letter. Then there's another time. Paul, Paul's just moved by the state of the world. He's gotten tender. The gospel has tenderized his heart. And he writes this. He said, there are so many people out there, man, like seriously, who are totally against what Christ did on the cross. I've talked about this a lot, and it's actually making me tear up right now. It's heartbreaking, you know. See, real men are emotional. All men are emotional. And if you don't learn to express your emotions in healthy ways, men will express them in destructive ways. Now, Pastor Jonathan, I've worked and I've lived with men and women my entire life. And I've discovered that we are equally emotional. I just think in general, women have been encouraged to develop maybe a healthy vocabulary mm. to understand our emotions. And we've been encouraged to lean in and feel things and communicate them. Now, we're going to drop a chart into the chat room. And you're also going to be able to download it via this QR code. This is something that my children use in their schools. Posters like this are in every classroom because students are now learning from a very early age to identify their emotions and taught that there are a variety of emotions, not just one or two. So when there's a problem in the classroom, what will happen is kids will go to these posters and they'll identify which emotion they are experiencing in that moment. So I thought maybe we should have a bit of fun with this. I'm going to show you how it works. Okay. okay? So me and you are both going to choose maybe this past week, what's one emotion, Pastor Jonathan, that, and then I'll tell you mine, what's one emotion you have felt this past week? You know my personality, I just want to say happy. You, you experience that a lot. Well, I, at least I pr project that yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, but I'd have to say worried. Okay, you want to continue on? Isn't tell that us. enough? I think I gave enough words No, no, there. no. We're going to practice here. So, like, tell me, okay, so when you felt, you don't have to tell us the exact scenario, yeah. but, like, tell us how you felt, what was happening that made you feel worried? You know, I was worried because it was about something I couldn't control. Okay. And uh, that puts it out of my control. And I don't know if you guys are like me sometimes. I feel like then I just busy myself because if I don't, if I don't, you know, if I don't think about it, it'll go away. And how does that work usually? You start thinking about it even more. And I've noticed in life that unless I can find, give voice to it, the emotion and what's going on, it's harder to deal with it. So when I acknowledged what I was feeling, not only did it help me lean into it and address it, but it also helped me to give it to God. I was just able to give it. My emotion led me to a place of prayer. Fantastic. Good. I'm going to give Shelly this uh, poster. She, can she put should it up put it kitchen. up. She's got yeah. three guys in the house. It's not yeah. always fun. Yeah. Okay, my turn. Yeah, where um, are you? So, you know what? So, um, in my house, it's crazy in the morning. So, we have three kids. <laughs> I know they're, where this is going. They're nuts. And so, I'm like constantly like, did you pack your lunch? Where's your water bottle? Do this. Do this. Like, I'm just a constant. Whoever's at home, constant rolling update. And so often I, I, I feel angry, but it's not actually angry that I'm feeling. You know what I'm feeling? I'm feeling overwhelmed. There's just too many things happening. There's too many people. And so it comes out as anger right beside it, but really I'm just feeling overwhelmed. You know, I remember the first time I went to see a therapist. Okay. And the person asked me, what are you feeling? <laughs> and I honestly, this is what I thought in my head. What do feelings have to do with what I'm talking about? Like, what does it have to do? And we all know there's like four feelings, happy, sad, mad, and ungood. 
<laughs> That's what I thought. And I remember in the moment of this, he passes me the sheet with all of these emotions listed on the sheet. And in fact, in the downloadable form of this, on the bottom, there's a list of emotions. Now, the one he gave me was more than that. I didn't want to overwhelm you. There was over 271 emotions. Wow. And I, mo- I realized in that moment, emotionally, I'm a toddler, friends. Emotionally, I'm just learning how to walk. But it's really important that we find our place and we recognize everyone's an emotional being. Thankfully, I love scripture because these two alpha males are very emotional, but God is too. Mm -hmm. Emotions aren't a problem. They're welcomed. They're a part of who we are. Friends, we've been trying to take some of the weight off of you. Guys, we've been trying to show not that we just appreciate you. We wanted you to find and recognize that there's what the culture says about you, but you're not a problem. There's what God says about you. And that we can find our identity in the way he created us. In a moment, Pastor Jessica is going to pray over the men in this church and over the dads in this church. And then I'll come back with a benediction. But I want you to think about that fact. What is identifying you? Where are you finding your identity? In the culture or in your creator? Make no mistake. It's actually really hard to be a man. You have to be cool, but not too cool. Consistent, reliable, but not boring. Ready to juggle anything that life throws at you. You must boldly face danger without showing fear and never let them see you panic. Because Because men men can't can't panic. panic. You have to be strong, but not too strong. You must be emotionally available, but not too clingy, because too much sappiness is weakness, and weakness is failure. A man man can't can't fail. fail. You were taught to be the provider, but not to seek provision, to protect, but never need protection. Lead by example, take the hits, stand in front of your people, and when it hurts, don't you dare show it. Never Never let let them them see you cry. Be curious, but not lost. Be fun, but not frivolous. Be tender, but not weak. Be strong, but not harsh. You have to stand up for the women around you, but make sure you don't stand in their spotlight. (laughs) You are more than the expectations that society places on you. In fact, You need to defy the outdated stereotypes. You're not a cowboy, so don't love your sports too much or too loud. Not your cars either, and certainly not your motorbikes. But hey, mister, you are more than a man. You're a human. Not a problem, not a mistake. You're a tapestry woven with complexity. A blend of strength and vulnerability, of resilience and sensitivity, and it's your humanity that drives you to the divinity. Jesus was a man draped in humanity, filled with divinity. Jesus, strong, tender, playful, and wise, a servant, defender, a children gatherer. Young man, old man, Young men, old men, look to Jesus, look at his life, look at his example, and find your identity in him. Would you all stand, friends? Pastor Jessica is going to lead us in a prayer for all the men that are in the house and that are online. Men, we love you. We respect you. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, we thank you for the men that you have blessed with us at One Church TO. Today, we ask that you would help them, God, to walk confidently in your design for them. Would you strengthen them, God, so that they can strive to be faithful, strive to be sacrificial, protective, and nurturing? Would you come alongside of them and be their strong partner? 
give them strength, give them wisdom. God, give them the words that they need to leave a legacy like David and Paul and like you, Jesus. And in the moments, God, where they struggle, would you remind them that you are their good father? Mm. And would you help them? Would you help all of us learn that we can follow in your example? Thank you for our brothers today. In your name, amen. Amen.